I think uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, issues early on with the pandemic was everyone out of, I don't want to say just out of fear because there was also guidance to stay inside the house. Um, we took it uh, very seriously and also um, a, a bit too extreme. Um, but it was very necessary and very critical to, um, to have, you know, to go out, get some fresh air, get some sun. And it's amazing how much the sun really affects us uh, when we do, uh, when we do um, go out into the light. Um, Abuna, Anthony, are you back yet? I will assume no, but Sanya Abuna Anthony is, uh, is in and out. Absolve me, Abuna, if you could hear this. Um, so thank you so much for reaching out to me and uh, asking, asking me to give a word. Um, I, as many of you know, uh, this becomes more of a discussion. It's, it's a, the topic tonight specifically is actually a very productive talk, and it's something that it is so necessary for the church to come together to do work, to do, um, to do not just work, but to do the work that, that we were called to do. Um, and oftentimes, because of lack of direction, or oftentimes because of fear, um, we find ourselves actually not doing anything. And that is also a very, very scary thing. Um, actually, uh, a church that does nothing is a dead church. Um, and it's, uh, it's necessary, again, to heed the words of the gospel in terms of what it is that we're called to do. Um, so as many of you know, if, uh, if you've already received uh, the, the message, um, the topic for tonight is being a living witness in 2020. Uh, being a living tw a witness in 2020. And of course, I'm sure when you got this message, because this was my reaction, uh, when you got this message, you were probably like, uh, for the last three and a half months, I've been staying home. What kind of witness can I possibly be? And, and what does that mean? What does it entail? And, and why do, you know, like, why am I even in this place? Like, why am I in this predicament? Why am, in, am, am I, you know, um, part of something that is way beyond my control? which on a human level is so frustrating, right? When, when we are put in positions that are beyond our control, that we have no control over, such as a pandemic, that it frustrates us and it makes us feel so powerless and so um, in, in, inactive uh, or, or again, uh, uh, lacking in terms of what possible good or, or effect can I have on anyone or anything, let alone myself. That being said, we should start with ourselves, right? Um, I know that there was an absolution given to the church that we could take um, uh, absolution or we take, uh, uh, priests can take confession over the phone. So a great first step in terms of working on myself first is, is you know, taking on self-reflection and, and self-analyzing of myself and, and reviewing my life the past three and a half months have been a great opportunity for us to come to terms with where we are in life, who we are, and who we are in context or in reference to who God is in my life. Um, and this is necessary, again, for this particular topic of uh, being a living witness in 2020. How can I be a witness in, uh, in 2020 if I myself don't know who I am? So, so again, the first step uh, always priority before you do anything, before you apply for a job, before you um, uh, travel, before you have to know what it is or who it is you are. You have to, again, analyze, self-reflect, uh, self-evaluate. One, who you are, your tools, what you possess, and also, again, what you need to do in order to be prepared for what you're about to, to pursue. Again, if you're going on a road trip, you need to make sure you have gas in the car. You need to make sure you have supplies. You need to make sure what stops are along the way so you're not stuck. Um, you're not going to start a, 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 a tour or a drive if you don't have enough gas in your car because you'll be stuck in, 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 a, in a place where, you know, in a desolate place where you can't fill up gas. Then you'll have to call AAA and it becomes a waste of your time and a hassle and, and um, same with uh, applying for a job. You're not going to apply for a job if you're, well, sometimes if you're overqualified, you'll still apply because for the need. But if you're underqualified, 
um, it doesn't make sense to apply for an executive position if you're still entry level, you've never had experience before, you don't have experience to build upon. But the same goes in our spiritual lives and the same goes in our, again, being a living witness to the world. Why? Because we need to know whether or not we have the right um, uh, uh, equipment to, to pursue. So I wanted us, and if, if I could trouble someone to share their screen so we could read the gospel together, um, I wanted us to read two passages, both in the gospel of Luke. So whoever the host is, um, by default, you'll be the screen share. No problem. One second. Thank you. Um, the gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 1 to 6. Uh, Luke 9, 1 through 6. Luke 9, 1 to 6, yeah. And anyone can volunteer to read, feel free. Guys, I'm sharing my screen, you have to read. That's the, the rule here. Should I call out names and then we could see who's paying attention who's not? Feel free. All right. Sylvia. <laughs> you're ready. I could see that you're ready. So. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Thank you, and glory be to God forever, Amen. This uh, first uh, commission is directly or directed towards the 12 disciples. Okay, so if you want a blueprint of what our Lord commanded the disciples, here it is, go out, right? And, uh, and he gave them uh, the power and the authority over all demons to cure diseases. He gave them everything he possessed. Our Lord possessed. Our Lord healed, they healed. Our Lord cast out demons, they cast out demons. And, and we know later they came back so joyous and so happy and so uh, proud that they were able to do all these things and what was Christ's response? If you remember, I'm going to test your memory a little bit. When they came back so happy that they were able to cast out demons and to heal diseases and, 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 Christ told them what? He said, and greater than these things you'll be able to do. Greater than these things you'll be able to do. I actually don't have the, the quote. One of the church fathers says, what is greater than all of these uh, great things that they did? He says, leading a sinner to repentance. That is greater than healing the blind, than raising the dead, than uh, 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 curing diseases, than casting out demons, leading a sinner to repentance. And I want to do, I want to disclaim this part of leading a sinner to repentance, not because you call, you see someone and you say, aha, you're a sinner. I'm going to chase you down until you repent. No, no, no in the sense of in your love, which is the love of God in your life, that he has really um, uh, uh, planted in you, people can see God in you. That you're able through this love and through this, again, great power that God or Christ has, has given you, you're able to reach others. And in reaching others, they can come to terms with who they are in terms of if they are at a place of sin, or if they are sinners, they can come back to repentance. I wanted to make that correlation simply because we look at the apostles and we look at the disciples and we think, I'm not healing the blind, which means I'm not holy, which is far from the truth. I'm not healing the blind. I'm not casting out demons. But then to think for a moment that you being able to reach someone who has never experienced the church as a mother, or has never experienced 
God as father or has never understood this beautiful paternal love and sacrifice that Christ bore for us on the cross and his amazing victory over death and, and the devil and sin on the cross, to be able to lead someone to understand and to acknowledge that and to realize that so that it convicts them and it cuts them at the heart, that is even greater than what God empowered the disciples here um, in curing diseases and giving them authority over all demons and all the power and, and, and. This we can call the first commission. Why? Because it's the first, it's, it's, it was commanded by Christ our Lord to the 12 disciples. And of the 12 disciples, we know Judas was, was there. So Judas was probably also one of those people that was able to cure diseases, um, uh, cast out demons, heal the sick, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I mentioned Judas is because Judas, as you know, holy or, or empowered as he was, he also was able to falter. He was capable of faltering. And he did falter, just like Peter was also one of the 12, and he did falter. So I'm mentioning these two examples simply because I want us to also be very honest and true in knowing that the way of Christ is always uh, an, an a ongoing forward motion. If you're, if you're driving in a car, I don't know why the examples I'm giving today are all, are all about cars. If you're driving in a car going up a hill, you have to constantly keep your foot on the accelerator. You have to constantly keep your foot on the gas. There's always a forward momentum and uh, always a forward push to pursue, to move forward, to, to continue up that hill. Same with our Christian walk. Judas reached a point where he stopped pressing the accelerator. He started to turn away. He, started, he stopped moving forward. Peter reached that point too, but Peter repented and Peter returned and became the great uh, apostle that we know and sometimes and i know that there's a a motto out there that the that the setback sorry that the comeback is greater than the setback is always greater than the setback you know that sometimes in our fall it actually allows us to to get up stronger and better it didn't work for judas when he fell he stayed down and for peter it worked because when he fell christ restored him he was able to seek the reconciliation of Christ. So this was the first reference, and, and, and it was a, a direct, a directed towards the 12 disciples. The next reference is in chapter 10, less than a chapter later, or one chapter after 9, verse 1 to 12. So if Mina, you can turn to chapter 10, verse 1 to 12. And also we'll need one or two volunteers, whoever would like to read And if you have comments or questions now, we, by all means, or we could save them till the end to have a discussion. I would love for us to talk. Why? Because what I said in the beginning is very true. This, this is one of those topics that it is so critical for everyone to come on board, to see what we need to do in order to thrive in the service, to thrive in uh, uh, being living witnesses, to thrive as a community, as, as a as a uh, body of Christ. Um, and what I mean by thrive is to go out and to, and to proclaim the good news, the gospel, the story of, of love and reconciliation and, and completion in God and in each other. Um, before we read, any questions or comments up until here for, from what we just spoke about? Okay, we could uh, continue reading. All right. Who's reading for us? <laughs> oh, no, I think you got to just call another name. Sure. <laughs> um, Mina Armanias, can you read the first uh, four verses, please? Uh, one to four? Yes. Okay. Um, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go then he said to okay. them actually you could you could pause here Mina. sorry so um just again as an understanding so we are one chapter later and here is also the great commission but now christ is pretty much giving the same command 
but he's giving it to the 70 apostles. Um, and, and it's a little more thorough in terms of the instruction, but, but also very similar, very, very similar and very um, uh, relative, of course. It's the same preaching. It's the same good news. Um, the difference is with the apostles, um, he spoke more of how he empowered them to cast out demons and to heal diseases um, and such. Here, he didn't really go into that. He spoke more of the practicality of going about, of going out and, and how to go about and to go out. There was more of a practicality. There was more instruction. And it's a beautiful, when we read about the Great Commission, again, um, it's, a, it's a great blueprint to understand or to see how Christ wants us to go about this blueprint um, or, this, uh, or what the instruction are for us to go, to go about. Okay, sorry, Mina, go ahead. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money, bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. Okay. Um, Verena, can you, can you read, please? I didn't say Marina, I said Marina, sorry. <laughs> Marina. <laughs> Which one? We got a, I think there's, there's two here. I'm looking at someone that's unmuted already, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, hi, hi, Una. I'm from hi, Michigan. Hi, nice Michigan. Hi, hi Marina. Okay, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, where, where do you want me to start? Uh, verse five. For, for, okay, um, but whatever... Well, whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go, do not go from house to house. Do you want me to keep going? Sure. Yeah, it'll be easier. Thank you. Okay. Um, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city, which clings to us, be, uh, we wipe off against you. Uh, Mina, can you scroll up? Sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Um, nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in the day for Sodom than for that city. Um, woe to you, uh, Chorazin. Woe to you, Beseda, for you might... For yeah, your, for uh, the, up until 12. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, and glory <sighs> to God for every amen. So... So I wanted us to pretty much break up this passage. Um, verse 1 to 12, chapter 10, very easy. Um, but I also wanted us to be very practical. So when we read verse 1, right away, our Lord says what, um, or the passage says what, it says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. He appointed them and sent them two by two. Right off the bat, it is not um, part of uh, the, the blueprint to do things on your own. It is not in the spirit of the church to do things as an individual, singular, um, uh, and, and apart from the body of Christ. And what I mean by that is, that's not to also mean that, you know, one person has to work with the whole body as one. No, you know, the body uh, is, is specific to utilizing different talents to different um, uh, respects or to different um, uh, uh, um, tasks or, or orientations. But, but being alone or, or serving alone is not, is not something that, the, that, that Christ ever wanted for his church. Meaning, again, that you don't take on a task and you say, I'm doing the Lord's work. And when someone comes to serve with you or to, or to um, uh, you know, give input or to, or to support or to um, uh, uh, commend or to um, be a, a, a co-op with you, 
that you reject it. So it is very critical that when a service takes place, at least two of you are present. And this is biblical from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. In the Old Testament, um, in, uh, in Ecclesiastes, uh, we read two are better than one. Why? Because if one falls, the other can lift them back up. Um, and in Corinthians, it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, it says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So if I'm going about with another person and, and, and I'm preaching, and let's just say my preaching is wrong, it's false. I have someone who's accountable to correct me. And also, the same goes for the opposite. If my preaching is true, I have someone who's accountable to also vindicate or to, or to um, say, yes, this is true. To be able to have a witness with me also gives more prominence to the message. And so when Christ sends them out two by two, he is, is really looking out for themselves so that they don't fall, they don't falter. They are not distracted because on the way there will be distractions and there will be not just distractions from them from falling away from the message, but distractions in the sense of their own ego. Uh, we've seen it historically many times over where certain individuals are given a certain authority and because of ego, they want to elevate further or they want to become more prominent. And so they become a name uh, or to, to make it even more worldly, they become their own entity, their own corporation, and it turns into this business model. And, and it is so telling how the devil will take full op opportunity and full advantage of these situations. So when you have someone who is co-oping co or cooperating with you, the person with you will, you know, if they see for a moment that, you know, you're, you're getting too um, gassed up or too, you know, uh, too prominent in the position, they can, they can humble you. And I'm not saying in a, in a way that is demeaning, I mean it with full of love. The message of the gospel and the message of, of, of two servants or co-servants working together is, should always be relayed in a message of love. Um, so right off the bat, when, when we read about the Great Commission, our Lord sending them out two by two is telling us, do not just think, you know, you can go and, and, and do everything on your own. You need accountability. You need someone, again, who will um, uh, uh, keep you in check and vice versa. You, you will do the same for them as well. Um, any comments or questions on this point or any, you know, I could ask questions and, and have you guys also talk, but what, what potential issues do you guys, can you guys think of that can get in the way of not serving two by two or not, or, or what potential issues do you see in two by two? We could even take it from that angle so that we could also be prepared for when there is conflict among two working together. Um, I, I actually think sometimes maybe two is not enough. I think sometimes like two, um, it ends up being a lot of the time you know, two or three or four or five of the same folks, right? Mm. And um, the idea that there was like, the idea that there was 12 didn't stop the 500 from joining them, right? So oftentimes in our church, you see like, um, you know, groups, like two, three, four, five people, maybe it doesn't stop at two, but right. it, it caps out at a certain number because people perceive like those people got and, and that, that I think is a detriment to the church because there's a perceived like, oh, if that's happening, what else is there to do? What else is there to do in the service? There's already, it's already being done, right? Where am I going to fit in? Um, so I think it's the, the capping out at two or groups of, of people or one person or whatever that, um, that is an issue. So, so can we say, Mina, that scalability is, is critical? Yeah. Um, yeah like, like and that it's not capped at two also. If I, because I think I may have sounded that, you know, we're capping it. So I'm, I don't mean to mean that as well, for sure. No, no, absolutely not. You, you, didn't, you didn't mean that. I'm, I'm just saying like, for some reason, at least in our churches, we cap it out at two each, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. you definitely didn't mean that. And uh, 
but it's like we we do that to ourselves in our service i i don't know why um maybe <coughs> there's enough to do hmm. it seems like people cap it out in their own mind yeah and i and and to add again the the scalability is very necessary then to know again what we're scaling against so you can you can also have you know two people uh dictating or or serving to the capacity of you know a whole borough for example because you're going to want to organize and you're going to want to break up the borough into you know whatever if it, if it's feeding the homeless if it's if it's uh uh passing out messages of hope and renewal and uh you know whatever um yeah, I, I agree with you. We shouldn't cap it at two for sure. Dr. Samir, you're going to say something? Yeah. <laughs> I could tell. I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think uh, sometimes uh, it's difficult for people's personality to work with someone else. And I think it needs a lot of humility uh, to be able to work with, with two people or more than two people because... I guess in many times there is a conflict of opinion or everyone wants to serve in a different way or uh, yani, we, are not, we are not identical and we think differently. So I think uh, it's very important to work taban, with people. That's definitely very biblical, but it needs a lot of humility. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be conflicts. For sure. For sure. You're, because, because not every... Um, every individual is a complete match for, I mean, look at marriage, for example, right? Marriage, if, if there is no conflict in a marriage, there's, prob there's probably no communication going on. <laughs> you know, that's probably the best case scenario, maybe. Um, and, and if there's no communication in a marriage, then, then there is no marriage when you think about it. Um, you know, but no two individuals are exactly, you know, are, 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 I don't want to say are not a perfect match because actually perfect match is a very relative term, um, but, but they're not going to be completely in sync. We saw this actually with Paul and Barnabas and Mark. Barnabas wanted Mark, St. Mark, to serve with them. And St. Paul said no. He said he's way too young. We don't want him, you know, sending. Actually, he started the journey with them. And then he reached the point, St. Paul, and said, you know what, Mark, we don't need you. Go back. Go back from where you came from. And at that time, St. Mark was younger. He wasn't of the same um, uh, education as Paul. Paul was, was himself a very, you know, uber brilliant, you know, Hebrew um, and Pharisee that, again, he was unmatched. But he didn't see use for Mark at that time. Come years later, he calls for Mark. Because at that time, he actually needed him. There, there, was, there was a need for Mark at that time. So, so there is definitely a need for humility. There's a, a, a need for practicality also. So as much as Paul may have not seen a use for Mark, it was because he probably saw also there were issues that were going to take place. Um, one of the interpretations I heard of this particular passage is that Mark himself may have not been able to handle all the martyrdoms that were happening at that time because he was young. And so, you know, why Paul wanted him to go back, we may not know the exact answer, but we also know it wasn't the right time for him. And that's okay. But it didn't stop the whole service from pursuing. It didn't stop the, the again, the preaching and the, and the going about and the sharing of the, of the, of the good, good news. Um, I, go ahead. Just because St. Paul didn't think that it was time for Mark to serve, does that mean that even, even if Mark felt inclined by God to serve, that he shouldn't have served? Because he was, he was told not to serve, basically, or like, we don't need you right now? So it depends on the perspective you're looking at. Yeah. The perspective, for example, from Paul, Paul was not ready to, to continue in that service with him. Yeah. So it could, it, he could have been hindering him at that point. Let's just say it was the point of Mark being so young that he's not able to handle all the martyrdoms that were taking place. It was too gruesome and he didn't have the stomach for it. And so it, it slowed him down. It slowed Paul down. But it didn't also mean 
that po that Mark leaving would inhibit Mark from doing something or doing something else. Right. Maybe it was a time for him to grow, whether uh, whether it was in education, you know, that he would read of the scriptures, he would um, contemplate further. Of Mark wasn't one of the twelve, you know, more of what the disciples spoke about with Christ in the 40 days and the interpretations of it, like maybe it was a growing period for him. We don't know what took place, but also we know that Mark also had ended up in Egypt and preached the gospel and wrote his own gospel of, of the happenings of the life of Christ and end. Right. But, so just hmm. because somebody tells me, you know, we don't need you in this service. Doesn't mean I'm supposed to just say, okay, well the church or this person said, no, then I'm not going to do anything. Mark. No. That's not what Mark did, exactly. No, absolutely. And, and it's a great point because, because we take it as a complete rejection, as an absolute rejection. Right. But we don't realize enough to, why not be a little more intuitive? Why not see if my service isn't being fulfilling, and I'm not talking about personal fulfillment. I'm talking about you know, the task at hand. Maybe I am a slow step inhibitor you know, of, of, the, of the big vision. So what can I do to support in different ways? Not necessarily the same service. I, I, and I know we're talking very broadly here. We're not even talking specifics. So it makes it a little more difficult, but, but there will always be a calling for you. And, and sometimes that rejection, or I don't wanna, I, I, you know, we could say it's a rejection, but sometimes that lack of readiness for this particular service is actually a message from God telling you I have a better or, or, or a better service for you, or something that is customized for you per, per se, something that will, will allow for you to grow and for you to, to be more of um, uh, the servant that I'm calling you to be, you know, right. whatever, in whatever capacity. Because sometimes also our failures in service, and this is where we have to be a little more sensitive in our hearing, our failures in service can inhibit us and can actually put us in a place of guilt and despair and, and not knowing whether or not service is for me ever. Like sometimes our own failures will say, this is not for me. And that was never the intent of our Lord. You know, our Lord didn't say, you know, of the 70, I'm gonna send out 50 or 51. He called the 70 and he sent out the 70 plus the 12. You know, sometimes we put matters into our hands and say, well, if, if this didn't work out, then I'm never going to be good for anything in service. And service, I know it's become, you know, uh, like we say this often enough now that everyone should, be, should know this. Service is never just about teaching Sunday school. That's the easiest in terms of finding a service. There's always a need for a Sunday school teacher. But to be intuitive, to be creative, to think a little more of what is the need in particular for where I am, that will guide you better. It's not necessarily what you're being dictated more than it is of, of what your eyes see in terms of where there's a need. Um, and the, and the, the notion of where there's a need comes also from your trust and faith in knowing that God is placing you and will equip you with what those requirements that you need for that need you know, that you will be given those, those requirements. Um, now, going into verse two, when, when Mina, you spoke about, about how it shouldn't just be limited to two, verse two kind of addresses that, but at the same time shows you the problem. Because then it says, then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So one, pray that the Lord will constantly guide and give laborers and provide the laborers, just as he provided this, uh, the 70 and the 12. We pray for more laborers, but we also serve to the best capacity that we have. So if I am dealt with just me and another peer to serve to some capacity, you're probably better off not complaining that there aren't more. Why? Because our Lord acknowledges it already. And instead of complaining, we should be praying. And, and again, he directs us so easily in this that in essence, he's telling us, don't worry about your complaints. I already know the issue. I know the problem. 
I don't need you to complain about it. I need you to pray about it. And when we're doing that, when we're praying about it, we're putting it in his lap. We know that he can see and he knows and, and, and understands. And he knows that I lack. But he also is the all, he's the, he's the completion. So when he's sending them out two by two, and he says the laborers are few, pray the Lord of the harvest to, to send laborers. Who's the Lord of the harvest? It's him. So the Lord of the harvest is the one who also provides the laborers at the acceptable time, at the right time. It's the same as the analogy with the butterfly. The more it, or the cocoon, in the cocoon, the more it struggles in the cocoon, the more ready and prepared it will be to fly. And if it comes out before the cocoon, and I don't know if it's a myth or not, but you know, it's, it's what we've heard. And, but if it comes out prematurely, it will never be able to fly. And I feel the same goes for our struggle in service. If there is struggle in service, it is, it is still a continuous work in us that makes us grow all the more. Um, go ahead, Mina. I saw you unmuted. Uh, I was going to ask, we, we talk a little bit about this. Um, Uncle Samir always encourages us if we feel uh, burnt out, you know, take some time, mm -hmm. uh, ease up, you know, we don't, we don't want you getting burnt out. What, what do you think burn, burning out, uh, especially in the service, uh, not necessarily in life, but like, you know, in the service, I don't know, I can't think of exact examples in the Bible where you really see burnout, but, you know, is it because there's a lack of communication with God or maybe you really are taking too many things on? Like, what do you think of, of spiritual burnout or serve, burnout in service? Um, I think burnout is a very real thing. Um, and I think the problem of burnout is that we don't know how to say no. I think, I think there's something in us that guilts us to not say no. And the problem is we're not realizing that when we say, when we don't say no, we're hurting, not just us, we're hurting the people we're serving. So it is so critical and it's, it's a real thing for everyone, for priests, for uh, servants in Sunday school, all servants. I'm not even going to say priests. And for all servants, it is so real that burnout is so, it's, it's easy to happen. Um, you can have, um, uh, like we saw in Zoom, Zoom uh, prayers and services, you know, and my heart goes out to so many people that put in so much time. There's great blessing upon blessing upon blessing. But if the reflection comes back in bitterness and in pain and in, uh, in a feeling of, you know, what a waste of my time and what a waste of my life, then have you really served? And I'm not saying have you really served. I'm, I'm talking from your perspective or from, from a personal perspective. Have you really served? Yes. Many people have benefited and, and maintained that, that bridge between the church and them. It's, it, that, that's the beauty of our church is it did everything possible to maintain a connection between its mother, the church, the mother of the church, and the home or the, the family. But burnout is so, so, it's so real and it's so critical because burnout can also determine how far or how much, how willing you are to continue. And, and the, 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 the idea is knowing when to say, you know, I wish I can, but, but I'm being pulled in this way right now that I'm, my heart is in this right now, or my mind is focused on this right now. Why? Because if you don't care about yourself, care about those that you're serving. If you don't care about, you know, you being fatigued and you being tired, I get it. But worry about those that are relying on you and, and are not benefiting enough because instead of you giving 100% into one thing, you're giving 10% in 10 things. And that's, that's really the travesty is we think that we have to be a jack of all trades. We have to be giving in every capacity. And again, there's blessing in this. And, and I'm faithful in knowing that Christ will fulfill and Christ will be the increase and Christ will, will still find, um, uh, you know, um, perfection in this weakness of mine. But I could also avoid it by being smart. 
that I do my task that I'm called to do, but at the same time, I put the person I'm serving as priority. Um, and if I do that, then I will know I can't, I can't commit because, because if I do, it's going to be a disservice rather than a service to you. That's very critical. Any thoughts on burnout, guys? Um, I don't want to be the only one speaking about it. And I would love to actually hear more about experiences of burnout because everyone experiences it. And this is very, very practical, especially for this topic. I think Sylvia wants to say something. But she was holding back. You know me so well, Amuna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I don't know how it specifically relates to burnout, but um, sort of a lack of motivation. Um, how, what, what do you do with that? Uh, so what triggered this is your, uh, anal your road trip analogy. You kind of understand like where you're going to go. You have a map. Um, but what if, what if the, the, there's no destination in mind? You don't really have a goal. How do you, how do you go about that? So this is where you would need to pull over and start to understand the motive behind what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, understand what, again, you possess in terms of, are you capable of doing it in the first place? Because you could be like, another analogy is, is the hamster in the wheel, just kind of going nowhere and, and going there fast, you know, going nowhere really fast. And you think you're doing something, you think it's productive, and then get so disappointed that you barely moved an inch, you know? And, and the lack of motivation isn't necessarily, I don't wanna say it's a dead end. It, it requires, again, the, the, the counterpart or the, the, the accountable party that can support you and can listen and say, you know, how about maybe it's possible that it is burnout, very possible. There, I mean, when, when it comes to the lack of motivation or, or the being kind of indifferent or um, not as motivated, it could be many factors. It could be burnout. It could be, I'm just, I'm over this. And I, you know, and, and I'm just doing it just so that, you know, it is something that needs to be done. And so I, I can't stop it. But again, it, if, if it's, if it's that, that's, I don't want to say, it, you know, you should stop it and you should move away. No, there has to be a, a communication that takes place where if a transition is necessary, you want to make sure that, this, that the service goes on. But also don't fool yourself in leaving a particular service to nothing. Because what we do is also we think that as long as I made sure that the service is continuing, I'm okay. Actually, you're not okay because then that's where you're not pressing, uh, pressing on the gas. You're not accelerating. You're not moving. And it's actually worse than the hamster running in place. It's actually not moving at all. You know, at least the hamster running in place is still able to build muscle and burn off calories and, and, and be lively and moving. But if we are taken out of the service, it's like a fish out of water. That's not what we're called to do as, as Christians or disciples of his. Um, the, the, the question of the motivation requires that you pull over and requires that you start to ask yourself, okay, what do I need to do in order to, to, you know, pursue something that I think I can give more of myself for that can fulfill me and in essence, fulfill others. The disciples, when they went out casting out demons and coming back happy, there's fulfillment in that. And Christ understood that. He saw it. But he also wanted to humble them and tell them, but you're going to do things that are even greater than this. I don't, you know, as much as I see how happy you are and excited, Imagine how much more you're going to be excited when one sinner returns. When you see that this kingdom is really like a, a growing kingdom just of, of believers coming in, in multitudes. There's beauty when we see our church growing. It's like, a, it's like a, a, a field of flowers and you're just constantly cascading these roses throughout the field. You know, as opposed to first it's the 12, then it's the 70. And then now you're getting, you know, we, we see uh, uh, the 3,000 that were baptized. I mean, you see the growing field of, just think of a bed of roses, and it's just continuously growing in his kingdom. Um, 
so it, it's a very, again, it's very valid. It goes, it definitely goes with the burnout question. The burnout question, the lack of motivation, these are things that we as servants and as faithful need to be very um, uh, accepting of in the sense of knowing that it exists. Because if we're in denial of it, then we will definitely, again, fall away from it. We'll probably be resentful of the service. We'll probably be resentful of the person who put us in the service. And that's not the spirit of the church, or that's not the spirit of Christ in us, to be resentful of my brother or my sister, blaming them for putting me in something that I feel so bad about, in a sense. I just want to say something, a good example in the Bible about the burnout is Eli, uh, Elijah. Yes. Uh, yes. Elijah at one point felt that uh, he is by himself. Yes. Uh, and the whole world is against him. He's scared. He's worried. Yes. And uh, God dealt with him very nicely and very smoothly, uh, gave him a break and uh, fed him and and then later on give him a task to anoint the king. Yani, it's uh, even with this holy people that can happen. Yes. Okay. Verse three, I'm going to read it to you and I'm going to ask you a question. You guys tell me. Verse three, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And I want you to carry neither money bag or knapsack nor sandals. So you're going to be barefoot and greet no one along the road. Don't talk to anybody. Carry neither bag or knapsack. So don't take money with you. Don't take a knapsack to rest comfortably at night if you don't find lodging. Don't have sandals on. You're going to be barefoot. You're going to walk on rough ground and don't even talk to anyone. Why in the world would I want to do this? <laughs> Why in the world would I want to serve and be, and be part of this harvest or be, part of, be a laborer in this? I mean, the, the presentation that our Lord Jesus Christ gives the apostles here, I would be like, all right, <laughs> see ya, I'm out of here. Why in the world would he allow this? Or would I, would I want this for myself? So this is a question I have for you guys. Nothing good ever comes out of being comfortable. Okay. Who said that? I am, I'm, I'm blocked. Hi, I'm Myrna. Hi, Myrna. <laughs> so, I mean, the whole lambs among wolves, he, he's telling them to anticipate that you're going to be outmatched and you're going to be outnumbered and you're going to come across problems. And so he's, it's not, it's, he's not sugarcoating it. He's telling them it's, it's going to be hard and you're, you're going to see that it's going to be hard. So I guess that's a part of that is like, no, like there's this mantle that you're taking up you know how it's going to be so it's your choice going into it to to take it up and to understand the, what might come out of it but to do it regardless because nothing good comes out of being comfortable excellent i think also part of it is he wants them to understand that they're going to preach essentially that yani we're not from the world Mm -hmm. So if you're doing that with with every item like from the world and like doing it by the means of the world, like it's, it's it contradicts almost. So like you're not of the world, so show them that you're not of the world and and that the the wealth of the world doesn't matter and indulging and 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 the like worldly actions doesn't matter either. Yeah. Great. Uh, to add to add to what Myrna and Gabby said. I think the message itself is the motivation for me to take this responsibility and how, how important this message is for people and, and the love that God puts in me for the people. Uh, I think it's the main motive for me to go on even with this kind of circumstances. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> I, hey, it's Rina here. Um, I think it also it goes to show that anything that happens along the road, it's not of them or because of them, but it's because they literally have no resources, but it's through the Holy Spirit. Um, so it, it acts as kind of like a reminder to us, like, you know, when, when we go out to serve, um, 
there should be no like relying on ourselves and our resources and the things that we might be <clears throat> we might have like material things but rather on like you know the holy spirit and on god to lead us and to guide us excellent i, I mean everything you guys said is is definitely on point the the understanding and again the presentation is is he's honest our lord is very honest with us um or he's telling us again the the he's giving us the instruction not to take anything of comfort or anything of um of need why because because if you have none of this you are forced to trust in him you have to trust in him and and when he when you are ridded of this and i don't want to say when he rids you of this he's telling them don't carry anything don't take anything and 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 again maybe maybe it was more symbolic but he's telling them trust in me i will be your provider the provisions will come from me and provisions coming from me doesn't necessarily mean that christ comes out with you know shebeshib or sanadil or sandals um it, it means that he's the one providing through whoever so when we read continue in the in the in them going into the towns and they say peace be unto this house and then he says and if they give you food and if they give you money and 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 these are the provisions this is what christ is providing for them that they are messengers of him and he, they are messengers of god in this in this uh, uh harvest and through those that are they are serving they will be provided for but the most critical aspect of our service in in our um uh serving in 2020 is to trust in him to trust in him and and coming to that point of trusting in him allows us to be more um at ease in knowing what we lack it's good to know what we lack but it's it's important to know what who we trust it is of utmost importance to know who we trust because if i put my trust in anyone but him i'm going to falter if i talk to anyone on the way i'm going to falter from what my goal was to go or i may be distracted again and again there is so much that can be said just on this one verse to trust in him but also not to trust in anyone else we seek direction from our mentors from our spiritual guides from our servant uh uh Uh, colleagues or peers but it most critical is to trust in him and understand that your servant peer can fall short and can put you in a predicament uh that you know is is not the best because they themselves get burnt out or they themselves uh fault or they themselves talk to people on the way and and get distracted on the way or get distracted with whatever other worldly things in their life but trust in him and he provides um we're almost done just so you know i know um we're uh we're limited on this time at this time um and so in going to the homes you accept the the gifts are that are given and and again that means it you know it's a gift from god uh, and and here we're speaking literally because the disciples were going to preach the good news for us to speak practically it can be in in any and whatever capacity if we're serving let's say in a local soup kitchen and we make uh, great relationships with the soup kitchen there is provisions being made in order for us to thrive in our service further we can we can connect with a broader net of people in order to serve more and this is that aspect of growing you know the the harvest or serving the harvest to a greater capacity our our the the it may not be exactly duplicated in terms of how the disciples served back then and how we serve now but the blueprint is still very much the same that in our relationships we can grow in our uh, commitment to one another in service we can do more we can serve more we can serve better guidelines are we trust in him guidelines are we go two by two or not just solely alone guidelines are we we uh, uh, we pray for more laborers because the service is continuously growing and needs uh, more laborers um guidelines are to expect acceptance 
from some and to also expect rejection. And we see Christ speaking at the end about rejection, that you may go to one house and you say, peace be to this house, and there's peace that settles on it. And you may go to another house and say, peace be to this house, and they don't want that peace from you. And it, again, we could take it literally, but I also want us to think again more practically in terms of here, we're not going to knock on households you know, of strangers at an environment like this and say, peace be to this house and expect them to allow us in and, and, and you know, provide certain things, but we can serve to whatever capacity. And the question is, what are we doing during this time? At this COVID time, what are we doing? At this time of pandemic, or outside of the time of pandemic, post-pandemic. What are we doing as a church? What are we doing as, as servants? How are we being that you know, reflection of Christ in our lives, preaching the good news and the good message? Yes, Christ laid it out, showing us that you know, it, it, you're going out as lambs among wolves, but he also expects us to trust in him because he also is the provider. He provides the necessity. This is where uh, we will uh, conclude. Um, thank you for your time. And we, could, we have questions and comments. Um, we could discuss further before we, we end. It's a simple message, but at the same time, it's, it requires constant reminders and it requires us to constantly be, I use the word intuitive a lot, but creative and, and again, um, thinking broadly in terms of how can we, how can we serve? My biggest um, peeve when it comes to service is that we have to be cookie cutter and we have to duplicate and we have to, and if it works, wonderful, God bless. But also there are times where we don't have to be cookie cutter. Why? Because the needs of, you know, a church in, you know, uh, country town, Pennsylvania, are completely different than a church in uh, the heart of Flushing, for example, or the heart of Queens. You know, two different needs, two different types of services. You probably need more social services in the Queens area uh, requirements or services than you would in, you know, country land, Philly, or Pennsylvania, not Philly, you know. Um, in DC, there's probably more government jobs, so there's more need for, um, you know, networking and corporate services. Um, where in Egypt, it's more about construction and building and, and you know, uh, uh, helping those that are lacking in certain ways in the poorest of the neighborhoods. Like different neighborhoods have different needs, different requirements. And this is where you as servants need to come together and just start to organize and say, what are the different categories of services that we can do? And I'm sure you guys have already done such things. I'm saying, this is again, the outline. The outline is trusting in him first and foremost, making sure we are equipped with support in terms of other fellow persons that can serve with us um, and being open to rejection and being open to acceptance. And, and he is the fulfillment of it all. He provides, he, he leads, he guides. And don't forget Christ, when he sent them out, he sent them out to places where he himself was intending on going. What does that mean? When he sends out the disciples to places where he was intending on going, he wants, us, he wants them pretty much to, to, to prepare the land and then he comes and he increases. He blesses. They're not the ones blessing. I mean, they're blessing, but loosely termed. He blesses after they have already prepped the land, per se. You know, if we're talking as a farmer, per se. Thoughts, comments, questions, discussion? I have one uh, question. Um, last week we had a speaker talk to us about um, assessing the needs of your community. And uh, I guess my question is, um, if you've maybe been in, in the same service or the same sort of group um, for a while and, and maybe we, we assessed needs, 
um, we, there, there's a tendency to maybe get set in, in certain patterns or habits. And so I guess the question is, how do you reassess the needs of those that you, who you're serving um, in, a, in an intentional way? Yeah. So uh, one of the hardest things is not to be a sensitive bunch, right? Because sometimes we have uh, uh, servants that are sensitive and they've been doing the same service year after year after year that certain rules have to kind of be in place. And what do I mean by rules? Meaning we have to start organizing a little more administratively. And that requires that we have rules to say, you know, uh, last year, uh, so and so and so and so, you know, four, five, six, seven people were working on the retreat. We can, you know, from those six or seven, take out two or three so that another two or three can you know, get into the, the hang of it. Because it also allows for a different angle, a different take, creativity again. Certain people are going to look at sports from one aspect of, you know, we should break it up and, you know, have people compete and have a prize and, and do whatever. And then another person comes with a different philosophy of, no, we're only going to play sports for the fun of it you know, different people have different views and different approaches to how to implement and to carry out things. But the last thing you want is someone to be cemented in a particular service. And I think that's what you're talking about, um, Mina, right? The, the, that sometimes because we get cemented in a role, our enthusiasm from the first year, have, you know, being in this role, dies out by maybe, if not the third year, the sixth year, if not the sixth year, the 10th year, you know, and the enthusiasm is, is so necessary for the pursuit of, of the growth of the service and of, of the message or of the goal that we want. Um, but sensitivity is so critical. And that's why it's so important. And I, I mentioned this earlier, that when we are speaking about such things, we are speaking in love. The, that love factor is so critical. In, in relaying the message, because if you relay in a way where, hey, listen, uh, five years ago, you really took us like, you know, to this level of, of a retreat and it was wonderful, it was great, but then people have gotten bored at this level, you know, and so they want new and exciting and more creative things. So why don't we get someone else with fresh ideas? And you know what typically that is? Typically, that's the younger generation, because at that time, when, when, and I say the younger generation, I'm telling you to, to, to anticipate this, it always happens. When, when someone has been serving in something for so long, the ideas become a little gapped, or the, the needs, again, the question of needs is so critical. What is it that we need? You know, the problems of one generation can be completely different than the problems of another generation. And if we're still serving the same capacity five years later or 10 years later, the anticipation to think that the same issues that people had 10 years ago are the same issues that people have now. There was no Instagram, there was no Netflix, or maybe there was, but still started. You know, there, there were a lot of things that didn't exist 10 years ago that have become a new crutch or have become a new tool to use. Or, you know, we've, the service in using social media as a platform, especially during COVID, that's a whole nother story, has skyrocketed. Churches that never used technology in the past were forced to use technology now. Churches that never, um, you know, had cameras in their church had cameras now. Churches that never had online donations had online donations now. There were some churches that were only reliant on their money box in the church. Can you imagine that? And, be, and if you're reliant on the money box in the church for donations and your church was shuttered for the last three and a half months, that means that church never received income for the last three and a half months. Where a church that was prepared from way back when, because not prepared because they knew of COVID, but prepared in the sense of had online donations, 